Good morning, Prentice Church. If you would, stand to your feet. If you're joining us through live stream, you, we just want to invite you to worship with us this morning. Welcome. This is the day the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Just worship with us today. We waited for this day. We're gathered in your name, calling out to you. Like a fire, awakening desire will burn our hearts with truth. You're the reason. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're seeing. Open up the heavens, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart. Continue to stand. Uh, so good to see everyone here today. And uh, for those that are watching on live stream, so good to have you join us today. I pray that something we do, something that we say would encourage you, would, uh, would bless you. But most importantly, we know that this time isn't about us. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ receiving honor and praise, and that's just what we want to do here today. So if this is your first time with us, welcome. Uh, you're meeting a quarter of our church family. Uh, the other three quarters uh, may be online today, so hello for those online. Uh, and uh, maybe some came during the first service. So uh, we certainly miss our church family, but we also understand that these are different times. Hey, it is... Um, you know, a special day for us on several reasons, and uh, I want to go ahead and skirt through this. Lori, Jamie, um, we had set this day apart that uh, we would just give a special appreciation to these guys. Uh, March 15th, when it came, uh, it came, boy, it came out of nowhere, and you remember that. 
and uh, we had to we had to set up church differently immediately and um, our online presence had to go to a completely different level and I just want to say as the pastor um, and uh, our pastor's council and I think I can speak for the whole church body that um, Jamie and Lori have done an incredible job of keeping us connected through social media through our live stream and all the things that we have been doing um, as far as the media department. And I just want to give you an opportunity, and I know some of you brought cards and gifts. There's a basket out in the Northex. Thank you for that. There'll be more said um, maybe in the coming weeks as different people come back. I just want them to know that we really, really don't take it for granted. 100% volunteer, and uh, we just, we love them so much. So. I know that there's just a portion of our church family here today. Jamie's in the booth working the live stream. Lori's on the keyboard. But would you let them know how much you as a church family appreciate them? Boy, we, we certainly do. Um, Elsie and Misty, so good to have you today. This is, um, you know, one of the hard things about this pandemic and I, you know, I don't want to fast forward the service and, 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 and get into some areas that I feel like I'm going to be getting into. But when I think about heaven, I think about togetherness, I think about joy, and I think about people. When I think about eternity and hell, I think about isolation. I think about loneliness. I think about pain. I think about death. I think about heartache. Quarantine has been more like hell than it has heaven because you've been disconnected from the beauty of togetherness. Does that make sense? I hope it does. When Angela and I had the opportunity to go hang out with Elsie and Misty in the passing of Bud and knowing that we were right in the middle of a pandemic and to know that the normal way a church responds, we just were unable to do that. And that was very heartbreaking. I want to let these two ladies know that we have not forgotten Bud, and as a church family, we've certainly not forgotten um, them, and uh, even in the middle of uh, a pandemic, our heart goes back several months ago to say that we loved Bud, we valued him as God's creation, and we just certainly missed out on the many of the opportunities that we could have showed love to them. But uh, maybe just as a gesture to Misty and Elsie, and I, once again, I know there's just a small handful of us here today, but would you let them know by putting your hands together that we love them and we affirm them. This morning, I want to ask you to remember Jeremiah Green in your prayers. Let me make a connection. This is, this, this is the son of uh, Matt and Becca Green. Um, a lot of family in this church. Uh, no, one of his grandmothers is here today. One of his grandmothers was at the first service. His siblings are here. But Jeremiah is going through uh, a diagnosis of Crohn's disease, and he's very, very sick. He's had a difficult weekend. Let me give you some hope. Let me give you some hope. Um, I have a very good friend whose son was diagnosed at about the same age with Crohn's disease, and he's now playing sports, two sports, and he's doing very, very well. So if God chooses not to heal him divinely, we know through the beauty of medical science that he is going to find some strength. And we've got to get through this dark period of figuring it out. But I'm believing the best days are ahead, Mark, for your nephew. And uh, we're just praying for him. We really are praying for him. And I want the family to know that, that we are believing for Jeremiah. So if Matt and Beck are able to watch today, we are in this with you and we're praying for Jeremiah. Also, Debbie Davis has a special need today. Remember her son in your prayers today. There's a special need there. Uh, we have not because we ask not. During this next song, uh, Jordan is on vacation this week. Samuel, Mark, the team, all of you, Annette, Carly, Lori, uh, Pep, we appreciate your work this morning. Excellent job in the first service. Uh, this next song tells us a story about the miracle of the crossing of the Jordan River. And it talks about in this story that God promised to meet with his people. And we need to meet with him again today. So however you reflect during this next song, I want you to go to that place where you can think about the goodness of God and that you begin to just utter prayer needs to him. 
And it looks like this to me. God, you're so faithful. You're so good. Thank you for your character. Thank you for always being there with me. Thank you when I took that math test when I was seventh, uh, in seventh grade and I thought I was going to bomb. You helped me. And just begin to talk to him. Just begin to talk to him. And I want you to do that during this next song. So, Lord, we give you this time. And we ask, Lord, we ask that you would come into this place and speak to your people. We meet with you today in the name of the Lord.
Worship him this morning. Praise you, God. Can you just lift up your hands and love him? We worship you, Lord. You are good. Take all I have in these hands and multiply. God, all that I am and find my heart on the altar again, set me on fire, set me on fire, take all I have in these hands and multiply, God, all that I am and find my heart on the altar again.
if you'll play softly. Um, you know, I would, uh, I guess I would just uh, be an absolute, um, Lord, I don't want to use the word nut job, but I'll use the word nut job. How's that one? Nut case. If I wouldn't have thought by now that our country, our people, would not have a sense of brokenness. Surely, surely, surely there is an element of brokenness in all of us, in all of our land. God, how are you using these situations to talk to us? What is the lesson that we must learn? Is there something about us that needs to change? Is there something about the body of Christ that needs to change? What are you trying to teach us, God? So Lord, this morning, I pray as we come into your word that you would let us encounter you and your grace and your love. Let us enjoy studying scripture together in harmony and in accord. I pray this in the good name of Jesus. Everybody said amen. Hey, would you do this for me? Would you distantly, let's see, distantly welcome one another? Can you do that? Kind of wave, fist bump, all those kind of things. However you feel comfortable, you may be seated. You may be seated. Mark, stay tight just for a moment. All right, stay tight just for a moment. Everybody else can uh, uh, kind of act like the rapture took place and be gone. Um, just for a moment. Hey, so good. To, I, I saw a church, and I thought this was good. And, and, and hey, um, first of all, those online, uh, thank you. If you see me on my phone, sometimes what I'm doing is I'm answering questions or I'm, I'm, I'm giving prayer needs or things like that. That's what I'm doing sometimes when you see me on my phone is I am, uh, I'm pastoring that online audience because they're a handful the, uh, the, the, the online audience, they get out of, you know, I got to kind of bring them under, under correction from time to time. So, no, we love you guys and praying for you. And um, good crowd at the first service. Uh, the crowds are building back. I know that it's taking time uh, for people to come back. So, uh, Mark, y'all did something yesterday, right? Y'all did something, unfortunately. So, uh, y'all ran a marathon, yeah, so Mark and Kim ran a marathon yesterday, so uh, let, let's let them know that was a good job, good job, yeah. So what interests me about this is, so yesterday y'all got up and y'all said, eh, we're going to go run a marathon. Is that the way that worked? I don't know if your mic is on, but is that the way that worked? Uh, I can't say that that's exactly how it works. So you just don't get up and no. say, today we're going to go run a marathon? No, we don't, you don't do that. Yeah, Unless so... You're yeah, I don't know if you can hear him. So what he said is, you just don't run a marathon. So was it, was it difficult? Yeah. Was, was the training more difficult or the run yesterday more difficult? I don't know. That's a, that's a tough question. Uh, I guess Kimberly, what say you? The hours of training were a lot to run the marathon. So where do you camp out? The run, the training, or the, the run? I would say she's probably right on that. Is it because you're scared of her? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm, I'm kidding. Uh, with you. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Because you can run. If she comes after you, you can just run. I don't know about today. But not today. <laughs> so, so I want to tell the body of Christ this. You are built for what we're going through. Yeah. Some of you, you don't see it. But the only reason that you've been able to go through um, the pandemic and we've made it, the only reason we've been able to go through uh, the riots and the looting and a lot of the animosity that's in the air, the only reason that we were able to encounter the big dust bowl yesterday is you were built for this. How were we built by this? Inch by inch is a cinch. Mile by mile is a trial. So what's happened is your faith has grown through the years because you've underwent small trials, small trials, bigger trials. And then all of a sudden, God said, whoa, I'm going to let you have it all at once. Does anybody beside me feel like the last three or four months, it's been like, wow, what else could happen. I guess, I guess uh, Mark, I'm just waiting for T-Rex to walk on planet. And uh, we'll, uh, good job. That's it. Good job. Um, I, you know, I, 
I, I don't think, really, I, I don't think if I walked outside and I saw a bunch of uh, locusts that were the size of eagles, I would be like, oh, never saw this coming. I'd be like, wow, Jumanji, <laughs> Jumanji. And that's where a lot of us are. We are just really scratching our head about, goodness, what else can happen? Well, today, I'm going to be all over the place. I'm going to be all over the place because in the early service, the Lord, I was going this direction, and then I felt like I should go this way. And so in this message, I feel like I'm going to start this way, but I can't wait to be able to go that way because I've got something I want to talk to you about in the closing. So um, I'm going to pace myself, pace yourself, because the second 15 minutes is what I really want to get to, but I need to tie some things together. Um, Two announcements today, all right, Uh, two or maybe two and a half. Um, congratulations are in order today. And if he's watching, I don't know if I've seen them online yet. Um, they probably are. But Willie and Kathy Flowers are proud to announce the birth of a new great-granddaughter. What about that? Little Evelyn Rose Smith, born June 24, 7 pounds, 14 ounces, 21 inches long, and she is the daughter of Valerie and Zach Smith. So congratulations to Kathy and Willie Flowers. Uh, I got to speak with uh, Willie. He was so excited. He said, would you tell my church family how excited we are? So we're telling the live stream how excited we are, and uh, they're excited, and we're excited. Also, congratulations are in order today to Dylan and Kendra a daughter of, um, daughter of Eric and Tammy Duval in the birth of Adam Thatcher Wadawitz, 7 pounds, 10 ounces, 20 and a half inches, born June 26. All right, so the birth of Adam and the birth of um, Evelyn Rose Smith. What about that? that? That is connected with our family. So we want to let these two families know how proud that we are that their king that that, that their uh, uh, their little kingdom is growing. Amen. So let's let them know that we uh, we honor them today. And uh, once again, once again to Jamie and Lori, it's our high honor. It's, it, it's just, we, we want you to feel special today. We want you to know that uh, w- without you, we would have limped through the quarantine, but you've kept us connected and you've done a great, great job. So if you have your Bibles today, I want you to turn to the book of Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19, and then I also want you to go to Philippians and uh, we'll be there in a few moments. So let's do this. Let's kind of recap, catch everybody up where we're at, and then um, then the second uh, the second ten minutes or so, that maybe that last half of this message, I want to talk to you about something that I'm going to be getting into in August that I hope will just whet your appetite because I think that this message needs to be heard, especially this time. Um, in our life. All right, here we go. So now you Gentiles are no longer, no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members. You are members of God's family. Together, together we are his house built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, all right? And the cornerstone, the one who holds all of this together, the body of Christ, is Jesus Christ himself. What an amazing testimony I heard from a brother in Christ, uh, Tom, uh, Pastor Tom Yang from uh, Beijing, China, underground church. You can't keep the church even underground. He told me about the time that he got his Bible, his very first Bible, and uh, got to hear that story Friday night to about, uh, that was shared to a couple of hundred people. But that's the body of Christ that was built Uh, As Jesus, the cornerstone, we are carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. Through him, you Gentiles are also being made part of the dwelling where God lives by his spirit. So listen and let me catch you up in case you haven't been listening online. Sometimes when you're listening online, you miss a part or two, and I want to make a connection. We are created for connection, but we drift towards isolation. Isolation. 
We are created for togetherness, but if, it's, if we're not careful, we'll drift and get all by ourselves. And boy, when we get lonely or we get by ourselves, we are subject to being attacked. We're subject to being attacked. So there's power in togetherness. That's one of the reasons, even though virtually we are gathering and we have gathered, is as a shepherd, I've been greatly concerned about people roaming out there without coming together because there's power in togetherness in person in body. There's power in that. All right. We're created for connection, but we drift towards isolation. Remember in the Garden of Eden, Genesis chapter 1 and 2 is about the perfect state that God designed his world to dwell in. You follow me? It was the perfect state, Genesis 1 and 2. Genesis 3 is where we are today. We're living in Genesis 3. All right, we're living at the fall, the demise of the kingdom of God or the ruin of the kingdom because of the snake in the garden or Lucifer. Um, He said in Genesis uh, chapter 2 that it was not good for man to be alone. So God made a helper for him because loneliness was not good for Adam. In John's gospel, John chapter 14, the disciples got afraid. The disciples got afraid because Jesus was going away. And they said, wait, 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 wait. We don't want to be alone. He said, it's okay. If I go, if I go I prepare a place, uh, uh, I'll prepare a place for you. And where I go, you may also, I'll come and get you. But until I come and get you, I'm going to send you a helper. I'm going to send you an advocate. Because nobody likes to be alone. So to fight isolation, I gave you three things. Everybody needs God, everybody needs somebody, and everybody needs you. Then I talked about how to tell your story. I gave you a Joshua chapter 4. In Joshua chapter 4, the people of God safely crossed over the Jordan. Once they crossed the Jordan, they were told to go get 12 stones, set up a memorial, because in the future generations, they would ask, what do these stones mean? And we would be able to tell the story. We know that stones have stories, stories of deliverance, stories of miracles aren't the highlight of the story. The highlight of the story is Jesus Christ. So that's kind of catching up where we've been. We are the building blocks of the, uh, uh, of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Brick by brick, we are, we are that body. All right, here we go, new material. Uh, the, more, the more mature I get, Maybe the older I get, uh, don't laugh at me because I'm young, uh, but the more I realize that um, my second half or my end is inevitable, okay? Um, That I've spent one half of my life already, and I have another half that I'll live here, and then I've got eternity that I'll live there. So at the end of this message, I'm hoping to bring some clarity to that to take the sting of death and the pain of death out uh, of, of, of our language. But uh, in thinking about that, that, that uh, maybe I get to do this for a couple of more decades, still healthy, um, that uh, I, I don't have a lot of time, and especially during a pandemic and a dust bowl, I don't have time to much think about what I want in a church. In fact, I really don't, don't really have a lot of time to say, hey, what, what, what do you think? Because believe me, the moment I say, hey, what do you think? We go in two, three, four hundred different directions. Well, I think this, I think that, I I would really think this. Jesus gives us a good indicator in his word in Acts chapter 2 and verse 42 through 47 of what we should be devoted to. And there are things within the church of the Lord Jesus Christ that we become devoted to that the early church was never devoted to. All right, they were devoted to fellowship, they were devoted to teaching, they were devoted to prayer, they were devoted to worship, they were devoted to kingdom. Uh, They were not devoted to a bulletin. It's not a bad thing, but they were not devoted to it. So we have become devoted to certain things that the early church was not devoted to. So we develop inside of our uh, our own world of things that we have become accustomed to, and they're our preferences. What happens is when we love our preferences more than we love the things that Christ has called us to be devoted to, then we get into trouble. Because we begin to make shrines and uh, things iconic that Jesus never made iconic for his church. There's no time during a pandemic and a dust bowl and a, uh, a crisis of cultures, there's no time to deal with edge issues. we got to focus on the thing, the centrality of the gospel that saves a soul. we got to get down to the grassroots. In Ephesians chapter 5, 
Love this verse of scripture that the Apostle Paul writes to Ephesus. He says this. He says, I want you, and I'm paraphrasing, to be careful how you live. I want you to be careful how you live. And then he says, don't live like a fool. I want you to be careful how you live. Don't live like a a fool. Paul must have eyewitness personally people living like fools. Don't be foolish with your living. And then he says, but live like the wise. All right? So be careful how you live. Don't live like fools. Live like those who are wise. Wise. Make, he goes on to say, make the most of every opportunity. But he says it this way. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. You would be dumb, mute, deaf, blind if you did not think that we were in evil days days. Now, how long have we been there? Did it just spring up yesterday? No, 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 no. No, they've been going on for decades and decades and decades. The pain of it is becoming more of a reality to many of us, but it's been going on a long time. We're living in evil days. We are living in days of, um, uh, boy, anti-establishment, anti-authority. I, I, I don't know if I've ever seen Uh, a time within the body of Christ that people despise authority more than today. They just just don't like authority. We just don't like it. We don't don't like coaches. We don't like teachers. We don't like cops. We don't like police. We don't like like, uh, uh, leaders. We don't like, listen to what we don't like. We don't like anybody saying, hey, this is what you should do. I don't want to do that. We have a natural bend towards selfishness, and we don't want to be instructed. And a part of the role and the responsibility of those that are over you are to instruct you in righteousness. And here here is what I have got to ground myself in, is if it is not heretical and against God's word, if someone over me in the Lord instructs me into a direction, I simply say, yes, ma'am, yes, sir. Unless it is anti-Scripture, I'm willing to go there. I've spent three weeks discussing created for connection, created for one another, and there is a sacred responsibility on this house, on this work, on this body. A sacred responsibility. Next week, I believe I'm going to talk about two sacred elements to our, to our church, prayer and the temple. All right? I believe I'm going to do that. We no longer, Francis Chan says this, we no longer knows what it means for something to be sacred. He goes on to say, we live in a human-centered world among a group of people who see themselves as the highest authority. What I have to say is important, listen to me. What I have to say is important, listen to me. I have rights. Now, please, do not think I am speaking to social injustice. As a Christian, remember what I just said, be careful how you live. Be careful how you live. We are not advocates of treating people wrongly. Absolutely not. Be kind. Be tenderhearted to one another. But in all of this equation of, hey, I've got a right to say this. I've got a right to do this. Hey, there's somebody a little more in power that has a right to, and his name is God. Have you considered that in all of this story that God has rights to? And today I hope maybe to bring some perspective in that. Uh, We're talking about created for connection. We are a body living stones. We are living stones of the work of Christ. And in order to do that, I I think we've got to look at something, how to selflessly navigate through life to where we don't live life that's all about me. If we're going to be in togetherness, we got to live for one another. In Philippians 2, 5 through 11, beautiful scripture here. Paul is writing to the church at Philippi and to you and I. Here's what he says. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Boom, stop there. You must have the same attitude that Jesus Christ had. Well, hello, why don't you make it difficult for me? Paul starts off, you must have the same attitude that Jesus Christ had. How are you doing with that? I just want to ask you, how are you doing having the same attitude that Jesus Christ had? The bar of holiness and righteousness is really high, isn't it? Have, 
have the same attitude that Jesus Christ had. And he goes on to say, I love this. Though he was God, listen to the intro, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, did not think of equality with God. Wow. He had all the rights, but he stripped himself of the rights to submit to God. So now you want to talk about what you have a right to? Hmm. In order to walk through this, and I I want to do this quickly because there's a lot of them, but there's five, how to selflessly walk through life. I want to give you five of these, and they're pretty, uh, yeah, pretty applicable and pretty easy to understand and unpack. Under one, there's actually 10 points under that, and, and I'm going to have to give them to you like this. So um, kind of a shotgun, just throw them out there. Here we go. Uh, number one, have the attitude of Christ. Let's do number two up. Have the attitude of Christ. Think less of yourself and more of others. So if we're going to navigate life and do life together, we're going to have the attitude of Jesus, and we're going to think less of ourselves and more of others. And if you are doing twice the talking and everybody else is doing twice the listening, then there is no way that you are thinking less of yourself. We think really, really high of ourselves. We really do. We really do. I am convinced, and I shouldn't say this, but if your Facebook post is more than like two sentences, I'm kidding. Sometimes I get it. I did one the other day. I get it. But don't think too highly of yourself. Please, 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 please. I just just want to say this also. A lot of people who like your stuff really don't like you. Did you know that? They just don't want to hear that you didn't like their stuff. Why didn't you like my stuff? So I just assumed a lie and say, I like you. Boy, that's hard. I I, I wish I could see what the online was saying. All right, think less of yourself and more of others. Uh, Number three. And then I'll kind of unpack these. Give up a privilege. Jesus did all of these things. Number four, take a posture of lowliness. When's the last time you've done that? And number five, humble yourself to obedience. All right, 10 things to have the attitude of Jesus Christ. And I've got to give these to you quickly. Number one, if you're going to have the attitude of Jesus Christ, you cannot have a superiority complex. Do not, I don't know how else to say, do not think you're better than anyone else. Do not think you're better than anyone else. Do not think you're better than anyone else. Why? Because you're not. All right? We're created in the likeness after the Father, and He loves us. Um, if, If you have your Bibles, there is an Old Testament scripture uh, that that I think that you need to hear especially if you have a tendency to think highly of yourself. Um, Have you ever met someone who uh, thought they were above the general population? It's kind of just, yeah, it's kind of difficult. And if you're going to selflessly walk through the life, you've got to have the attitude of Christ. You cannot have a superiority complex. You can't. You you cannot. Listen to uh, poor Job. Um, Job had had a terrible, terrible day. You, you probably know the story. And, and I would summarize it, lost everything. I mean, it was bad. It was all that we have went through over the past few months multiplied by 100,000 times. It was terrible what he went through. And in Job chapter 38, the Lord challenges Job. Then the Lord answered Job from the whirlwind. <laughs> Verse 2. Who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorant words? (laughs) Verse 3, hey Job, why don't you brace yourself like a man? Because I got some questions for you. If you ever want to climb up into God's throne and say, hey, I I want to ask you, be ready for the thunderous clap back when he says, I want to ask you. So, so, so listen to this. I, I, I like this. I like this. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you know so much. So, so he's asking Job this, and I, and I think sometimes in order to maintain the attitude of Christ, we've got to strip down that we're really not in charge, guys. We're not in charge. Don't have a superiority complex. 
Or number two, a complacency uh, that we get comfortable in. We get comfortable in com- uh, complacency. If the devil can't make you hurt others, he, make, he, he may just entice you to be comfortable. Don't, don't do that. Number three, glory seekers. Number four, b- uh, blame throwers. Someone already uh, always blaming someone else. Or number five, if you want to have an attitude of Christ, uh, don't just be nasty. What do you mean by that? Just Some people are just downright mean and cruel. That's not the way to do this. It's not the way to live out in what we call flesh out or incarnate the gospel. What about pity petitioners? The proud and the haughty. Or the passive aggressive agitators. This attitude haunts many relationships. These people are fearful of confronting others for a feel, uh, uh, and feel a lack of resolution because of the repressed emotion. God loves all of us, listen, and does not expect us to walk around ignoring sin and filled with irritation. He wants us to, uh, uh, he wants us to handle these relationships so that healing can happen. Number nine, and this is a lot of information, negativity spreaders. If you want to have an attitude of Christ, don't be a negativity spreader. Don't. Don't. Don't don't be like that. In in this, one of the things I've watched out for during this this pandemic is people who like to sow negativity and then they leave the room. They like to post something negative. And then just say, there's my opinion. And then they leave and they never respond. And they just create a whirlwind and they're nowhere to be found. Don't do that. That's negativity. Don't do that. Or what about me first lovers? John the Apostle would face this with a guy by the name of Diotrephus in 3 John. Believer in Christ. If you are in the family of Christ, be aware of your attitude And if you're going to selflessly walk through life, you must have the attitude of Jesus. Think less of yourself and more of others. When I think of this, this means that there are times that I need to see a need and go for it. S. E. Empower someone to do their job. R. Reach out to people that aren't in my circle. V. Validate someone. Pull them up. E. Equip people with a good story of hope. Think less of yourself and more of others. There are some times that they don't need to hear you talk. You just need to listen. You just need to listen. Listen to someone who is hurting. Listen to someone is pain, in pain. I learned a long time ago. I don't want to ask. I, I don't want to say, hey, raise your hand if you've ever been to a counselor. But since I'm up here, raise your hand if you've ever been to me. So I've been. And here's the way it works in case you don't know. Well, how are you doing? I'm doing really, really well. So what's been happening? Blah, 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 and I can't wait to hear from you again. I really do believe. Now, are you saying that therapists don't have counsel and advice? No, no, no. Sure they do. They have great advice and great counsel. Christian counselors, man, they're wonderful. You need them in your life. Christian marital counseling, you need that. You, you, you definitely need it. It's good for your soul. It's good for your soul. We need to learn. Absolutely. But they also, a good counselor also recognizes getting you to talk is very important. Getting you to share. Getting you to unpack some things that you're feeling is very, very important. Did you know when you come to Christ and you're ready to repent of your sins, what does he tell you to do? Open your mouth. Confess. Start talking. Start talking. It's really important. So think less of yourself and more of others. What about give up a privilege? Surrender a privilege. Maybe a parking spot. Yesterday would have been a great day. Give up a parking spot. Hey, I know you can't see because there's a great dust storm, so why don't you take my parking spot? You get it? Give up a privilege. Hey, here's a coupon for a free blizzard. It ain't no good anymore because we don't have a Dairy Queen, but here it is anyway. (laughs) 
Buy a, buy a tank of gas for someone. Give up a privilege. Take a posture of lowliness. Jesus did this. Humble yourself to obedience. Humble you. I want you to navigate the time that we have on earth well. As a believer in Christ, I want you to do the kingdom work here well. I want you to do it well. And I believe that these five things, having the attitude of Christ, think less of yourself, give up a privilege, take a posture of lowliness, humble yourself to obedience, are very, very important for you as a Christ follower. If not, people will scream, hypocrite. You're mean. You're cruel. You're hateful. You're hard. You're calloused. Those aren't the attributes of a Christ follower. Take the posture of lowliness. I always have to have the best. No, no. I, I prefer to you. I defer to you. I defer to you. I prefer you. I take, I take a different table. I give you the best. I want to pivot just for a moment and spend our final few moments together on talking about something that's pretty important to me on my heart. In August, we are going to start a series of messages, and I am not an eschatology in time theologian, but I'm going to do my best to talk about a place that we have sung about for years that we eagerly anticipate going to called heaven. So I'm going to talk about that place in August, hopefully for four weeks or so. If you're not able to be here, I hope that you'll check out the live stream. You need to hear this because I promise you, I'm going to say something that you've never heard before. I really do believe that. Maybe, maybe not all of you. L -l Let's test it. Let's test it. Maybe some things that you're interested in knowing. I believe in heaven, and for the online audience too, that there are going to be animals in heaven. I believe that. I believe there's going to be animals in heaven. Jesus is called the what of God? Lamb? God loved animals. When, when, when God was going to destroy, the, and I don't want to get ahead, but when God was going to destroy the earth and Noah was there, what, what did he save? The animals? Now, I believe the animals will be domesticated. They won't be wild. They won't be rebellious and mean. So maybe no, uh, 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 maybe no wild pit bulls or anything like that. Anybody here got a cat? Some of you. Some of you do. So look, I believe pets may make it to heaven. Really? I won't talk to you about it. Maybe not. Just, I just want you to be here. But if you got a cat, it won't be. Only dogs. I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. All right. I'm kidding. I'm kidding with you. I, I shared with you a few moments ago that heaven, the beauty of heaven is the togetherness, the harmony, the accord, the pain of death. So, so here, here's what most people think of hell. Most people think of hell as party, whiskey, and liquor, and the devil's down there reigning supreme, and he's in authority, and no, no, that isn't hell. That is propagated by hell itself. That mentality has caused many people to think, well, if I'm going to have a good time, I'm going to go to hell. If I want to be a chubby angel with a halo and wings and wear a white gown and be in a worship service 24 hours and seven days a week and sing, this is the day that the Lord has made, then i got to go to heaven. That is, not, that is not heaven and that is not hell at all. And I hope during this series that I can answer some questions about really what we believe Scripture teaches us about heaven and what hell is. And I'm afraid many of you have experienced the pain of what it feels like to be without people during quarantine. Of not having relationships. Of not having people. Of being in isolation. That is going to be the pain of hell and a reality that it lasts not for three months, but it lasts all of eternity. In Revelation chapter 6, all right, I, and I want you to be careful here because I don't want you to get nervous. Yesterday we were in a, Augusta, Georgia, and we were eating at a restaurant, and they did not pass out the menus because of sanitation purposes, social distancing, and germs. So we had to scan the barcode to get the menu, all right? So I want, you to, I want you to breathe in. I don't want you to get nervous as I talk about these things, but I want you to hear them at least with an open mind. In Revelation chapter 6, we're introduced to what we call the four horsemen. Now, this is not Ole and Arn Anderson and Ric Flair, and uh, I think it was Ted DiBiase uh, was the other. 
Some people didn't know who I just mentioned. Some of you did. Roddy, you knew who I was talking about. Yeah. Oh, wrestling, wrestling characters. There you go, wrestling, wrestling. John, the apocalyptic writer in John chapter 6, introduces us to the four horsemen. And the first horseman, I want you to listen to this. He says, as I watched the lamb broke the first of the seven seals on the scroll, then I heard one of the four living beings say with a voice like thunder, come. I looked up and I saw a white horse standing there. Its rider carried a bow and a crown was placed on his head. He rode out, he rode out to win many battles and gain the victory. Ooh, white horse crown. Yeah. In Revelation 19, you're going to be introduced to another rider of a white horse. Listen to this one. Then I saw heaven open and a white horse was standing there. Its rider was named Faithful and True, for he judges fairly and wages a righteous war. His eyes were like flames of fire, and on his head were many crowns. A name was written on him that no one understood except himself. He wore a robe dipped in the blood, and his title was the Word of God. How beautiful is that? The armies of heaven dressed in the finest of pure white linen followed him on the white horses. From his mouth came a sharp sword to write down or to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron rod. He will release the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty, like the juice flowing from a wine press. On his robe at his thigh was written the title, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Revelation 19 the only guy who, well, the guy who said it best was an old um, African-American preacher from Memphis, Tennessee. He preached, that's my king. You ought to Google that. That's my king. G.U. Patterson. Incredible. One of the greatest messages ever, uh, ever preached. That's my king. G.E. Patterson. In Revelation 19, that's my king. In Revelation 6 is going to be a falsified king. And I want to be very careful with this because I don't want you to have all sorts of fear. But I want you to be aware that as a pastor in sensing the times, and, and, and look, it's not been just the last three weeks, but I do believe that there is a spirit, I may say, of antichrist that is in the atmosphere. There's a spirit of lawlessness. There's a spirit of rebellion. There's a spirit of hatred against authority. There's a spirit of uh, lovers of pleasure more than God. As a leader, as a Christian leader, and I love you all, I love everybody watching this. Hey, you know, you know, tell me I can't come to church. I don't want to come to church. Don't tell me I can't come to church. Where are you at? I love you, but where? You wouldn't believe. Hey, you know, you're going to tell me I can't come. Where, where are you? Are you? I love you, but where, where are you? Don't take my right away from worshiping God. Now, now, now look, look, I know that there's people that are concerned about their health. Stay where you are. If you're vulnerable to sickness or, or maybe you've, uh, stay where you are. We know that. But unfortunately, I believe many have just given into the craze of nationalism and not Christianity. You are Christian first. You are Christian first. And I've said it many times, and I hope it makes sense, and I hope you don't think that I am anti-USA because I'm not. But he's not coming back for USA. He's coming back for a church. He's coming back for the body of Christ. Now, what I do believe is that America has been a great Christian nation. So, amen and amen. Proud to be an American. I'll sing Lee Greenwood if somebody played it. You understand what I'm saying? But we get so mad. Don't take my rights. Don't take my rights. Don't take my rights. And he's not stopped you. No one stopped you from praying. No one stopped you from worshiping. Except you yourself. Because you love pleasure more than you love God. I really believe that. I really believe that we love our toys in 2020 more than we love Jesus Christ. And there's a pastor's heart after being quarantined for four months. Love him with all of your heart, with all of your mind, and with all of your soul. For those that can't come because they're high risk, 
man, stay where you're at. Keep connecting. Keep connecting. I, I see these people every week that are connecting with us virtually, and they want to be here. I understand. So I would bring this to you. I bring this to you. Revelation 6, you know where we're at, and I'm going to close with this, I promise. If a prominent, educated, charismatic, good-looking world leader surfaced. You know, and Mark, I know you don't like attention, but we've got an apocalyptic writer here in the house. He writes apocalyptic books, and he's here, so this is a little intimidating for me to talk about. He's a wonderful author. But listen to this. It's hard for me to believe that if a prominent, charismatic, good-looking world leader surfaced that promised a cure for a disease, economic stability, and world peace, that many Christians would not buy it hook, line, and sinker. Like a hook in a mouth, just going, oh, oh, tell me more, tell me more, tell me more. You promise? You promise? Your granny told you it was coming and you ain't opening your ears. Granny told you it was going to happen just like these things. Now, could it, could it go on like this for another decade? Sure it could. But I do believe that we are in that stage, in that era, that our Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ, is going to return for his bride. And I just want the body of Christ to be alert and to be sober and to be aware. For your adversary is lurking, lurking. Hell is no party. You won't bring the whiskey and have a good time. It is eternal separation from everybody and anybody that you loved or know. Heaven? Oh, I done told you you get to take a little Ralphie maybe. I don't know. I don't know. I'm more about that later. You get to love people that you've loved. And here's, here's one of the great. You get to explore. Jesus is going to show you a vast kingdom. You're going to be in his presence. You're going to walk with him. You're going to learn and grow. You won't be omniscient because he is. He's God, not you. But you're going to grow and expand and get to do that for all of eternity. And who knows? You may get to be a chef and a cook. And others of you may get to be a waiter or a waitress. And all the sting and the pain. Do, do this for me. Maybe, maybe this is interesting. Maybe it's not. I hope it is. Maybe I'm not preaching to the uh, choir. Maybe you like this stuff. Um, Genesis, Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, pre, pre-fall. Did Adam work and labor? Yes. But after the fall, the thorn and the thistle became the consequences of the fall. Do you remember this? You remember this? Oh, we're going to carry out great responsibility in heaven. But the sting and pain of it are going to be gone. So, so what that looks like to me is I get, I get the special sauce. <laughs> I get the special sauce, the special O sauce from Moto Company, and all the sting and the pain of the calorie and the overweight belly weight goes away. I just get to enjoy that. I get to enjoy that. Maybe after nine holes of golf along the Crystal River, having just trout fished with Sean Parker and David O'Dell. Joy and peace and harmony and unity and togetherness forever and ever and ever. And then so in people's mind they go, and then hell, they're going to be singing heavy metal music and they're going to be drinking and partying. No, no. Heaven is the party, guys. Hell is the eternal torture. We've corrupted that thought process. And thus to one generation thinks heaven is boring And hell is fun because fun has to be wrong. And when the prodigal son come home, it had been mourning all up until that time. And when he come home, what did they throw? A party, a fiesta. Let's celebrate. One who was gone is now home. In this season of distress, let this community know. Let this household of faith know that I believe that the season is just right for our Lord to make his appearance. And as the writer of 
John says, even so, Lord, come quickly. Would you stand with me? I want to thank the online audience for being with us today. We pray blessings upon those that have experienced this online. And uh, we pray that, uh, we pray God that you would be with those. And uh, maybe there's someone online that hears all this. And they're like, oh my goodness, I don't know where I'll spend eternity. I pray that they would reach out to us so that we can share the gospel with them. And we pray this in the name of the Lord. Amen and amen. So thank you for joining us online.